Hey bees, I'm Marie from Humble Bee and Me, and today we are continuing a series of videos of tutorials and demonstrations that will be useful in combination with my book, Make It Up. So today we are taking a look at micas versus pure pigments like iron oxides, FD&C dyes, and carmine. So mica is powdered aluminum potassium silicate, and it is beautiful and shiny and shimmery and is just gorgeous in so many things. And so obviously we love it in our cosmetics for adding a bit of shimmer and gleam. You can buy micas in really any color, any color you can imagine. And that is because the base mica is colored by manufacturers in, you know, with a wide variety of pigments. So you can find them tinted with iron oxides. You can find them tinted with FD&C dyes. You can find them tinted with carmine and other wide variety of pigments. So you can get them in a ton of different colors. They are, however, sparkly and less potent than the pure pigments, which of course makes sense because the pure pigment is blended with the mica to create the colored mica. So you might be finding you're looking at a recipe and you're saying, oh, I don't have, you know, I don't have carmine or maybe I don't have blue ultramarine, but I do have a mica that is about the same color. So, you know, maybe I can use it instead. And so I wanted to show you how they stack up if we take an equal volume of a pure pigment and an equal volume of a mica and mix them into a same size cream base. And so you can take a look at sort of how it affects the final product. Obviously one's gonna be shimmery, well one will be matte, and we're going to encounter some potency differences as well. Now of course, with micas, your mileage may vary. Some are stronger than others, some are more strongly tinted than others. So this really is just to give you a basic idea. In general, the mica is always going to be less potent than the pure pigment because of course, the pure pigment is diluted with mica, so it's just never gonna be as strong as the pure thing. But who knows, depending on your mica, you might actually get something pretty darn close. Another difference between pure pigments and micas that's worth chatting about before we dive in is that pure pigments really do need to be ground and thoroughly blended to actually just really shine, to get that full pigmented colored effect that we're looking for. Whereas micas are already pre-ground and very effectively distributed, so stirring them into something is really, really easy. So if you've watched my lipstick blending video, you'll see that there's, like, there's a lot of stirring and smooshing and streaking to get a full, even color blend. Or you could pre-grind it, but either way, you definitely need a solid amount of mixing to really get the pigments from pure pigments to shine. Whereas micas have been pre-distributed, so they're much easier to incorporate, even though they are not as potent. Additionally, you should avoid putting micas through your coffee grinder because it does break them up and reduce the shimmer and the color effect. But come on, let's get started. For this experiment, we're going to be measuring 1 8 of a teaspoon of red iron oxide into a base that is 1 gram of beeswax and 3 grams of fractionated coconut oil. And then we'll be putting the same amount, so 1 8 of a teaspoon of this Colorona russet mica from Sapphire Blue into a base that is exactly the same. Then we're going to melt them together and check the potency levels. So you can see these are roughly the same color, so you could think that you know maybe somebody would try using one instead of the other. So let's see how that would work out. So there's one eighth of a teaspoon of red iron oxide and I'll just wipe off my measuring spoon here. And then we'll grab an eighth of a teaspoon of this similarly hued mica. So right away we can see that the red iron oxide has sunk straight into the oils and is wetting itself out whereas the mica is kind of sitting there starting to starting to incorporate with some agitation. So I'm going to go pop these in a water bath and melt them through. So here I've just got a wide shallow pan that's got about two centimeters of water in it. So like two thirds of an inch. I'm using less than I would with a lotion because of course these little dishes are much shorter and I'm going to go pop this on the stovetop over medium low heat for about half an hour to melt everything through. Everything has melted through. This one is the oxide and this one is the mica. So we're done with our water bath there. So I'm just gonna dry these off a bit. And they are nice and nice and toasty, which is great because it'll give us some time to blend in the pigment. So I'm just going to put down a paper towel here to protect the dish towel so that we don't stain it. So right off the bat you'll notice that the mica has really started to incorporate itself into the oil whereas the iron oxide is basically just still sitting there doing its own thing. 
So let's get in here and start doing some stirring and blending. The iron oxide will be a little bit trickier to incorporate just because the particle size is larger. So you can probably see here, there's some dusty bits that we'll need to streak and smooth out. And as I drag the spatula across the bottom of this prep cup, you'll see some streaks of the pigment starting to break down. I'm just gonna put this back in the hot water so it stays melted. All right, that is now pretty thoroughly incorporated so we can wipe our spatula off and then work on the mica one. There's the mica one. You can see that the mica has really distributed itself reasonably well. So once we start to stir it, you'll notice that it doesn't really need as much encouragement to blend in as the iron oxide does. And you'll also notice it has a really lovely sort of, it looks like an oil slick, like a nice sheen from the shimmer of the mica, which the oxides don't have because they are matte. So we'll just stir this, scraping around and blending down until it cools enough that everything will stay in suspension. All right, I'm gonna leave these to come to room temperature and then we'll come back and do some tests and check out how they turned out. Now that these have set up, let's take a look at them. So oxide, mica. So you can definitely see the colors a little bit different, but that's to be expected. We're more so interested in sort of the potency and appearance. So you can see that this one does have a bit of a shimmer to it, whereas this one is matte. So let's do a little swatch test on the paper towel here. Get a little bit on my finger. So this one, the one with the oxide, is definitely more, more opaque. I sort of shear this one out, it does shear out, whereas this one stays pretty, pretty opaque. So you can do a comparison on the skin as well. On my fingers here. So I'm definitely getting much better coverage on this finger, the one with the oxide, than the one with the mica. The more I sort of rub this in, just the more color I end up with, the, the redder of a finger I end up with. Or is this one sort of shearing out? And uh, much, much, much faster. So you can certainly see that the oxide is a significantly more pigmented, sort of potent pigment than the mica, which makes sense because the mica is generally going to be oxides and FD and C dyes that have been diluted with the mica, so it makes sense that they're not as pigmented. And there you have it, a little side-by-side -side comparison of pure pigment to a mica. So now you have a fairly good idea of why you probably shouldn't use one for the other, but you know, it just might work, and both are really fun to play with. So thank you so much for watching. Please subscribe and check the description box below for links to places to buy my book all over the world and also links to places to buy ingredients for the recipes in my book. See you next time.